All right, get ready for an exciting episode of the MCOE Best Practices Spotlight interview. I'm Lane Houck, your host, and today we sit down with Darren Shaw, the founder and CEO of WhiteSpark, to discuss, among other things, the latest findings from his 2023 local search ranking factor survey. With over 19 years of experience in the web industry and a passion for local SEO, Darren has become one of the most respected and influential figures in the field. Join us as he reveals some of the key factors that affect local search rankings, and he shares his insights on how to optimize your local SEO strategy. Welcome to the show, Darren. Hey, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, thanks for joining me. I really appreciate it. A lot of people know who WhiteSpark is. You're a big player in the industry. A lot of people know who you are. But I have a feeling there might be someone watching this show today that may have not ever heard of WhiteSpark or Darren Shaw. So maybe entertain our guests with just a quick intro. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So my name is Darren Shaw. I am the founder and president of WhiteSpark. We're a, a company that provides software and services to help with local search, ranking in the local packs, local finder maps. And so we started in 2005 as a web development company. And then in 2000, and we're doing building websites, optimizing them. And then in 2010, we switched to strictly focusing on local search, doing local SEO and building software for that as well. We also have a listing service where we'll go out and build citations. Maybe that's maybe one of the more famous things we're known yeah, for, our sure. local citation finder software, our local rank tracking software. We have a review software. We have a whole agency side. So we kind of have five different main things that we do. And I also do a lot of research and writing and posting and videos and speaking about local SEO, trying to teach people how it works and trying to understand it myself and then share what I learned. Yeah, that's a little bit about me. Cool. And there's been some definitely some shifting sands in the game of local SEO. It's over the last 12 to 24 months for sure. And Always. so I, I know that you've been working hard on getting your... How long have you been doing the annual local ranking factors study now? I know you uh, started so, with Moz even many years ago, right? At least uh, right, right. Yeah. So there, no, I never... Well, yeah, I think I did publish the first version on Moz. So the first version that I did. So I read it. That's how I know that. <laughs> yeah, David Mim has been doing it since 2008. So he published the very first ver version of it in 2008. And then he, he was an annual thing until he gave it to me. And now it's semi-annual, but <laughs> he's more organized than I am. But he did it annually until 2017. That's when he passed the reins off to me. So he did it for a long time, handed it over to me. I'm very fortunate to be given the honor to do the survey. Uh -huh. But yeah, so he did it personally. And then his company, Get Listed, was acquired by Moz. And so then he worked at Moz for a long time. So he did the survey through Moz. And then the first edition that I published on Moz, and then previous editions I published on our own site at WhiteSpark. Yeah. Awesome. So that's yep. a little history for all of you who are listening, just on the genesis of the local ranking factor study. Darren's taken over. It's, hey, let's dive in. What have you, what, you want to give us some, some golden nuggets about what you found? Yeah. So one of the things to say about the local search ranking factor is, and I guess you could say this about SEO in, in general, is that the fundamentals don't really change right. too much. It's just, you know, what drives rankings, content and links. And so it's the same thing with local where you definitely see a lot of similar things impacting results. And if I look at the survey this year, a few things are noteworthy, a few things worth mentioning. Do we assume that the audience kind of understands the fundamentals of local search or should we maybe just break that down first? Yeah, break it down, break it down. We went through it a little bit, but every episode has its own set of listeners, but let's break it down. You're the you're an expert. So let's, let's yeah. So the survey, let's just describe what the survey is. So the local search ranking factor survey is a Pretty long survey, it takes the participants about an hour to two hours to actually complete the thing. And it basically breaks down 150 potential local search ranking factors. These are the things that we think Google might be looking at to rank businesses in the local pack. So it's things like how many reviews do you have? What's your star rating? What is your primary category in your Google business profile? So there's like 150 of these potential signals that Google mm -hmm. considers and I get the participants to score them. So like how impactful is this factor for local rankings? How impactful is this factor for local organic rankings? So those are the blue links that show up underneath the pack but are localized to your city. Uh, how impactful are they for conversions? So people like something like your star rating on your Google business profile 
if it's a three, then you're probably not going to get too many clicks on your profile. If right. it's five or four plus, then four, you're going to get more clicks. So it's a conversion factor too, right? So we I actually analyze that those details as well. So I asked the participants to do it. And who are the participants? They are the the most noteworthy people, practitioners in local search. Many of them are Google business profile product experts. So they work in the Google business profiles forum. They answer questions. They really spend a lot of time analyzing and understanding what makes local search tick. They are local search practitioners. Most of their clients are local. They do local SEO. They're in the trenches trying to get their clients ranking. It's a, an invited list of 50 of the best minds of local search. So the people that are really out there publishing, speaking, talking about, tweeting about, just people that really seem to know their stuff in local, those are the people that get invited to participate in the survey. And so the cool thing about it is that when you get that, those 50 best minds in local to all do the same survey, you can aggregate results and the best of the best stuff the tactics, the things that really drive ranking surface to the top. And so that's what the survey is about. And the other thing that's cool about it is that the things that don't work are filtered to the bottom. People are like, no, that doesn't work at all. So yeah, let's talk about those things. So basically local search is made up of seven primary categories. So the categories being signals related to your Google business profile, your primary category, additional categories, things like that. Signals related to reviews, signals related to your website and your content, signals related to links, signals related to citations, which are different from links, and behavioral signals, and a little bit of personalization. So those are the main kind of groupings. Yep. And there's been a slight shift from last year. So last year, the groupings were weighted. The participants thought that about 36% of the local search algorithm was made up by Google business profile signals. And that's actually dropped this year to 31%. And I actually feel like that's a bit of a leveling out. I'd probably give it a little bit less personally, but the hive mind has spoken and it's 31%. Right. So that's, so signals related to that drive the algorithm more than anything else. And I think there is some truth to that. When you think of some of the things like proximity, how close are you to the searcher? That's a big signal that's really playing in the local search results. What is your primary category? Do you have keywords in your title, your business title, your business name that has a huge impact on ranking? So those things are such impactful signals that GBP section guides the weightings of the other section. So sure. you your Google business profile signals at 31%. That's a decrease from last year. We have website signals increasing 2% from 16% to 18%. That's a difference uh, over last year. So last time that we did the survey, it was only 16%. Review signals stayed the same, 17%. Then we have uh, link-related signals. Those actually dropped a little bit. And I think that you, we saw link signals drop by 2%. And on-page signals increased by 2%. So I think that's where the shift happened there. Yeah, makes sense. And, and then on the Google business profile side, some of those percentage weights were given more to behavioral signals. So that's things like people clicked on your, how many clicks did your listing get? How much dwell time did your listing get? People sitting around looking at your listing. Mm -hmm. and one of the things I thought was very interesting actually in the Yandex source code leak is that there's a very specific local signal of three minutes, three minutes dwell time is right there in the source code. It says it's a ranking factor. It doesn't say what the weightings are, but it's interesting to know that Yandex has that as an, a specific signal. Sure. If a person spent three minutes plus on your listing, ranking boost. Yeah. And it makes sense. I think it makes a lot of sense for Google to look at that because that tells the that tells them that whoever's looking at that result likes it. And so the takeaway there is that it's a Make sure you've built out your profile. Make sure you have just photos. You've got a really great yeah. uh, product section. You've got a full Q and A. Like you want people to spend time. There's gotta be content there to read for three minutes. Exactly. And so many business profiles are just like, here's our name, address, and phone number in our hours yeah. of operation. You're not gonna get the dwell time on that, right? So yeah. your Google business profile is a great opportunity to build it out and build it up and increase that dwell time. Whatever dwell time is a unknown weighted factor, but that's what I'm talking about when I talk about behavioral signals. Okay. And then citations, they stay the same at 7%. Citations are mostly business listings on yellow pages, whatever. It's a mention of your name, address, phone number, 
out there on the web. I think that this audience really knows that. So that's a general introduction to the survey and what drives local search rankings. Okay. One way to think about it is like SEO is content and links, your website, your technical SEO, making sure your website is fast, crawlable, plus all the content you have on your website and the optimization of that content, plus authority building, getting links to your website, right? links to your specific pages and internal linking. So that's traditional SEO. SEO. Local SEO is all of that. You still have to do all that, plus all this other stuff. And the other stuff is managing your Google business profile, optimizing it, building it out, getting reviews on Google and other sites, and then also business listing citations. So there's, it's like local SEO is even harder. There's even more stuff that you have to worry about and more stuff that you have to do. Did the conversation or topic of EAT ever come up within local SEO and the 50 experts? It does come up sometimes, so it's a thing, but uh, it's more, it lives in the world of traditional SEO more. Organic it's, SEO. Yeah, it's just, it plays a bigger role. When we're talking about the competition pool, let's say you're talking about local plumbers or denter, dentists, it's just, you're just not competing at that same level of content quality. And definitely there's benefits to establishing authority within your own city. Like I am the premier dentist. I am the premier plumber. And then these are our awards and certifications that all builds that up and plus the quality of the content. So it certainly plays a role, but it's not really talked about a lot in local. You don't hear a lot of people talking about eat, but you can definitely hear people like Lily Ray who talks about it all the time reference it in a local context, but it's, it feels like a bigger world, bigger SEO thing when rather than dealing with small business websites. Yep. Okay. How about products and services? Any mention and talk of that? I've, and I've, what we've seen for sure is that filling out, we talk about completing the profile, Yep. but getting into some of the specifics there, is there any in the survey, is there any weighting or, or scoring around the inclusion or the non-inclusion of products and services? So this is very interesting. So the survey came out, I gave it to all the participants. And I think the day that was the deadline to complete the survey, everyone completed it. And Joy Hawkins publishes a new post showing that services actually have an impact on rankings. Yeah. <laughs> Prior to that, everyone had tested it and said, no, there's no way. Everyone was mom on it, yeah. Go ahead, fill out all the things. So the survey is going to be skewed towards the previous thinking, which is services have no impact. And so you're not going to see that in the results, but Joy Hawkins recently published a, sur a case study where, and it's, it's, it's specifically the predefined services. And so what that means is that when you go into your Google business profile and you go to the services section, it will all populate now. The auto ones that they suggest, you're right. Like, so if, if you get the little round pills, it's like a little, do you want to add this service you're listening? If you say yes. So in her test, she added like, vampire facials it's like a spa thing uh -huh. and so when they added it the rankings for that totally went up and so this was the first time anyone had ever seen an impact of on rankings when with messing with services before you could fill out the services anything you added in there you wouldn't rank better for it have no impact on ranking it was more of a conversion signal it's like you're now telling people what your services are right so that can help you drive more leads but the the act of adding them and the keywords in them has no impact on your local rankings. And that's the same thing you can say about products, actually. Products have not been shown to directly impact rankings. And actually, I think this is maybe a fallacy and people thing that people mess up because they're like, oh, it doesn't impact rankings. Why would I fill it out? And the reason you would fill it out is you want people to convert, don't you? They're looking at your Google business profile. It's almost like, would you make a website and then not tell people about your products and services? No, that'd be stupid. So do the same thing on your Google business profile. You want to fill it out. And a big tip that a lot of people aren't really aware of is that you can absolutely use the product section for services. And so it's a really smart thing to do because as say you're a lawyer, you don't sell products. You're not selling gavels. Say you're a plumber. We're mostly selling services. Service, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so make a service make a product for every one of your services. And yeah. the reason for that is that the product section has beautiful visibility on your profile. It's right at the top, right underneath the address information. And you can have graphics and you can talk about all the different services that you offer in that product section. So make that stand out. And then you, 
you're going to drive conversions. So people will see that, they'll click on it, they'll click through to your website. You can track all that in Google Analytics with UTM codes, which is wonderful. You can actually track your conversions right from your Google business profile. And you'll see that product section drives sales. So fill it out. Even if it doesn't directly increase rankings because you got keywords in your product descriptions or whatever, and Google's not leaning on that. Same thing with the description field, your business description. Such an SEO myth is to make sure you put keywords in your uh, keywords, right? Yeah. Your Google business product is, or your Google business description, no impact on ranking. So you can put as many keywords as you want there. <laughs> doesn't help. So you want to write that like you would be writing, let's say the, the meta description, right? Meta description, we know doesn't impact ranking. Same thing with your Google business profile description. You write it to convert, not to, not to rank. The conversion signal, that's a behavioral signal, right? And so it's important. That's really weighted. A little tip here too, Darren mentioned it in the products. You can click through to a product or a purchasable product or service on your website from the GMB product, right? And if you have Google Analytics and you have conversion tracking set up, Google is going to see that trust signal of the purchase right off of the traffic of your Google My Business listing. And that signal is one of the most powerful signals you can generate around a product in a related Google listing is that conversion there. Because that tr- the trust signal is almost unfakeable because you got somebody purchasing with a credit card, link that to Google Pay, and you've got an even yeah. better signal. Yeah, and I guess even any conversion, right? If the conversion is just they filled out the contact form or sure. whatever, that's also another goal that you can track in Google Analytics. It's very helpful. to to show that. But I think that you also get that dwell time. You get more engagement, more clicks, more interactions, and more time spent on your Google business profile is always a positive thing. And so even though products and services may not directly impact ranking, they have a secondary ranking benefit because they can drive more of the behavioral signals and actually increase ranking. And that's been pretty well tested, actually. There's even companies that have a whole business model around sending clicks and dwell times to your listing and so they'll get like an army of outsourcers to go and click and and run a search click on your listing dwell on your listing click around in your listing and that definitely has a positive impact on ranking it's been tested and it works so we know that google's using these signals it's very interesting anything else around so one other thing that's related to product services is q a so anything about q a so Q&A, again, does not directly impact rankings, but it is a something that most local SEOs, most businesses, they're sleeping on it because it's a great opportunity. If you're browsing the search results and most of them have no questions and answers or one or two, but then you see one that has 37 questions and answers on it, you're drawn to that listing. You're going to look at it. And then you know what happens in that Q&A? It's what services do you offer? What insurance do you accept? What are some of the reasons I would choose your business? It's like this amazing opportunity to convince the reader that you are the business expert. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a massive place that you can put a whole bunch of frequently asked questions. So first of all, take your frequently asked questions from your website and put them into the Q&A. Second of all, you run your primary keywords and look at the people also asked section or use also asked.com to kind of look at what are the frequently asked questions around our services and build that Q and a section out. That Q and a section is a gold mine of conversion opportunities that most businesses are not doing. And so I love the Q and a section. It has been tested that adding keywords into those Q and a do not seem to directly impact rankings, but it's the conversion signal. And then the secondary potential behavioral signals by increasing interactions and engagements. It's a great section that most people aren't doing. And I'm actually, I've got a thread that I'm writing, a Twitter thread that talks about how to make the most out of your Google q and I think it's a great opportunity. Oh, and here's a great tip. If you didn't know this tip on the Q&A is that Google will pin one question to your knowledge panel, your business profile, if it gets enough upvotes. So what you, what we always do with all of our clients is we ask them, what is the question and answer that you really want everyone to see, this really uh, valuable one? And so then we get our team to upvote it. And so whichever one is the most upvoted is the one that pins to the top. Okay. And so as long as it gets three plus upvotes, it'll stay pinned to the top. So uh, that's, uh, that's a good insight. tip because yeah. otherwise it just says Q&A brackets how many there are. But the one that gets the most upvotes actually shows the question and a snippet of the answer, which is another thing that draws people in. 
For sure. One of the questions, so let's, let's, I'm gonna, before I get into this question, photos and reviews. I know yep. to me, I think I've seen reviews actually move the needle more than I was expecting in the last, say, three to six months. I don't know exactly. What's, what have you heard? So reviews is a great category of local search in general. There's a lot of different aspects to it. The current thinking from the top minds is that surprisingly, reviews don't really drive rankings. So and that's, this is shocking information. It's a little hard for me to swallow too. We know- It flies in the face of what we've seen and what I've heard. Like people say, I just got eight new reviews and my rankings popped. I've heard that story. Yeah. Like, so there is a pop. pop and it's apparently at a 10 review yeah. break point. So once you get- Past 10, 10 reviews. Once you hit 10 reviews, you get some kind of ranking booster. It, it, this is well established that there's, yeah. a, there's a break point at 10 reviews. It's like up till nine reviews. They're not really having much of an impact. As soon as you hit 10, 11, there is a pop. It helps. And, but the theory is that as you continue to get 20, 30, 40, 50, there is no additional ranking benefit. This is all based off of one test that Sterling Sky did. And I feel like we need more evidence around it because- It's it, not what I'm seeing. Exactly. And I also feel that way too. But the common thinking based off of this one test from Sterling Sky is that you don't see it much in terms of additional ranking benefit once you get into 40, 50, 70, whatever. But there is a theory that there's another pop that happens at 100. But- more testing required on that. And I think that there's a secondary benefit from keywords in the reviews. So when you get yes. uh, people mentioning your products and services in the review content itself, that provides additional- Not in the benefit. reply, but in the review itself. Yeah, and that's a great distinction because that's another SEO myth. Keywords and owner responses might impact reviews. Oh, I see it on TikTok all the time. Yeah. All these local SEO charlatans on TikTok. Trying to pack the review response with keywords. Oh, yeah. I hate to see it. And they also love to talk about geotagging photos, which is, again, pure BS that has no positive impact on rankings. Another SEO myth. But yeah, keywords and owner responses, no impact on ranking. Keywords in, in reviews, I believe they still have impact on ranking. Sterling Sky again did another study on this and they didn't really see much of a ranking impact. So that's questionable as well. When was that study done, do you know? Quite recently, in the last couple of months, I think. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, they published something where they tried to get a bunch of reviews and people mentioned a specific thing and they didn't see their rankings for that specific thing go up, which is very interesting. So maybe it seems like a lot of SEO sometimes feels speculative, right? We think, oh, of course Google would use that. And so we think that it should have an impact, but this is just one test. So we need more tests and we need more information. Another great one to look at is Google posts. A lot yeah. of people I was think- just gonna do So we got posts, offers, and events. So any distinction between the three, any, yeah. any new development on that as a ranking signal in terms of frequency or anything like that around post offers and events? So our current data on ranking benefits of posts is quite outdated. It's like four years old. It's like when posts first came out, people tested it. They started adding keywords to posts and tried to do it. So I'm actually running a new experiment right now. And I'm trying to test this without any polluting of the study with other signals. So I've got a, like a real fresh, clean listing that's not doing anything else. No changes to the website, no changes to the reviews, no changes to links. It's just really bare bones. Now I'm going to pepper it with posts and see if that moves the needle in any way. But okay. the current thinking is that posts themselves don't improve rankings but massive, massively wonderful for conversions. So posts allow you to talk about your specific products, your offers, your specials, your deals. And so I actually just did a video and Twitter thread about Google posts and how to do them right way. And the massive mistake that most people make with Google posts is that they treat them like social media. It is such not social media. Social media, who do you have? You have people looking through their feed. They're well, looking to be entertained. Drive-by. It's not the high-end temps. Yeah, they're just flipping. Their, they want to see updates about their friends and see funny videos. Google posts, intent-based shoppers. People are looking for a very specific product or service. They Mostly services. They want to know, like, they, they're looking for a new dentist. They're looking for a new lawyer for this specific thing. They need a plumber to come and fix their drains. 
So that leads to what? It offers, right? Offers, yes. Offers are wonderful. Talk about your specials that you have right now. You're running a 25% off deal on this specific service. That's a wonderful Google post. So do not post about your holiday party that your company did. That no one cares. Oh, you've hired some new people. Welcome to our new team members. These people looking at Google posts are not your customers yet. They don't care. They only want to find the best. So you either are using Google posts to sell directly with offers and specials and deals, or you're using Google posts to convince that you are the company to choose. And you can convince through lots of great ways to use Google posts. You can take your best reviews and repost them as a Google post so they get more sticky or some reviews are buried way down. Right, They're yeah. like three years old or whatever. Run them as a Google post. Make an image out of them too, guys. That's what I mean. Yeah, you take a screenshot and you put that up there. Another great one for Google posts are any awards that your company has won. Put those up there. They're convincing. They're conversion signals. And my favorite is a case study. If you, let's say you got great results. I've seen lawyers do this where they're like pre- Pre-trial, the, they were being offered $10,000 payout for their slip and fall case or whatever it was. We got our client $3 million. So that's amazing. Those kinds of case studies would be very good to convince someone that you're the, you're the lawyer to hire, you're the plumber to hire, whatever it is. And so using Google Posts the right way is really important, and they can be great for driving new conversions. So that's how you're supposed to use Google Posts. But rankings still undecided about whether or not they directly impact rankings. Of course, everything you do on your Google business profile to enhance it, to improve it, increases dwell time, increases interactions. And then you might get the secondary behavioral ranking benefits. Awesome. Good stuff. Let's see here. We covered Q&A, posts, product services. So photos. Yeah, photos are cool. So let's talk about photos a little bit. Yeah, there's quite a bit of data around the benefits of photos. Photos, listings with more photos get more clicks, they get more engagement, and they get more dwell time. That's a huge, obvious one. Um, I have seen some unpublished direct evidence from a major brand where they built out 20 of their profiles, their business profiles, with really excellent professionally done photos that also were run through the vision AI tool to determine what Google sees in the photos. Like what is, what is the content of this photo? Trying to get the right labels and then putting those on 20 of their profiles and comparing them with a control set of 20 profiles that did not get the photos and major visibility and ranking improvements on the one with photos. That is a very interesting case study that leads me to believe that photos have a very good impact on both conversions and rankings. Mm -hmm. And so photos are an opportunity I think that a lot of businesses are missing out on. So continuing to regularly upload photos, and I don't know if you've ever seen the Vision AI tool, but you can just Google yeah. it, Google Vision AI, and then it has this little thing so you can try it. So you can drop your photos in there and Google will show you what they think is in that photo. Mm -hmm. And there's an incredible case study where for a dentist, they uploaded two photos that almost look identical. They're just like slightly different angles. First one, you uploaded and it said, man wearing glasses. The second one uploaded, it's just like the guy is a dentist and he's in a slightly different position, leaning over a little bit more. And Google said, this is a picture of a dentist. Which one is better on your profile? Yeah, of so, course. Yeah. Now Google is... Oh, it's like keyword stuffing your Google business profile through your photos. You know what I mean? So this is a really interesting opportunity. But more, what's the word I'm looking for? More, I want to say covertly, because really Google's vision is reading that photo. Yeah. I had not seen that case study where it compared quasi similar photo and the way that Google would read that differently. But that makes a lot of sense even. It's awesome. And so the takeaway is to just run your photos through Vision AI and keep at it until your photos have all the terms. And you got to think about you have this business entity. There's an entity, you know, your business. And what does Google know about this business? They're pulling data from your website, your business listings, your links, all this stuff. They're trying to understand what is this business? What is it about? How prominent is it? How, what terms is it, are it relevant for? And so now if all your photos are also enforcing those things that you want to rank for, Bingo. your photos are covering the same topics, subtopics, 
topic clusters, that content is in the photos themselves, that helps increase your relevancy. It makes all the sense in the world. What we're doing for the agency owners, you know, what we're doing in SEO at the highest levels, we're just training the bot. We're training the exactly. algorithm about you feed it. the bot. You're feeding yep. the bot, yeah. I liken it, you know, the bot is the World Wide Web is like a worldwide maze. It's a massive web and maze of pages. Yep. And the Google bot is like a mouse. And the signals that we generate as agencies for our clients are like cheese throughout the maze. And if we drop the right cheese in the right spots, we'll lead the bot to the right conclusions. Yep. I think, I don't know if we're running short on time, but there is one interesting thing that I've identified in the local search ranking factors this year versus last year that I really wanted to highlight. There was this thing that happened in the 2020 local search ranking factors where the concept of spam fighting was a reasonably good tactic that people were doing. So spam fighting is you see a competitor in the search, in the local search results that's either keyword stuffing their business name or they have a fake listing or they have fake reviews and you report them to Google through what's called a redressal form and then Google suspends them they drop out of the listings and your business moves up and if you do that on five of the businesses that are above you wow you just moved up five spots so that's right. the concept of spam fighting and so in 2020, it was a decently strong signal, like strong ranking factor. It's like one of the things you can do, a great tactic. In 2021, it dropped pretty significantly because it became very ineffective. People were frustrated that Google wasn't taking action. You could waste a lot of time reporting everybody, but Google doesn't give two craps. Nothing yeah, would happen. Yeah. You know, they would not actually get removed. Interestingly, in this year's survey, spam fighting has increased. Where's my spam fighting one here? Had a pretty significant increase. Uh, yeah, it went from position 10 to position 5. So it like really moved up the ranks. And the reason for that is that Google's actually doing a better job of taking action on these reports. And so spam fighting is back. That's the takeaway here. It's a more effective tactic these days than it used to be. And so if you're wondering how to do it, just Google Google business profile redressal form. If you just go edit this listing, you can actually do that. Anyone can edit any Google business yeah, publicly just yeah. in edit, right? Yep. Those edits are automatically either approved or denied, but you can never get a business listing suspended from that. So you might say, oh, this business has the wrong name. You take the keywords out of the name and suggest an edit. And Google might approve that and then the keywords get taken out. But then the business owner just puts them right back in the next day right. or whatever. And so it's this cat, it's just like whack-a-mole game where yeah. you can edit, edit this business or suggest an edit. That's why you use a redressal form. So the redressal form actually gets reviewed by a human at Google, and then they can take real proper action. I'm looking it up here just because Google Maps redressal form. Yeah, Google business profile redressal form. We'll probably find it for you. Google business profile. Okay, we'll put that link in the in the replay of this for everybody too. Okay, yeah. great. Yep. That's great. Awesome. Anything else that was just something that really stood out to you from your most recent survey? This is a very interesting thing. If your business has the opportunity to use what are called department pages, yeah, like a good example is a car dealership. They've got the main dealership. Sales is the primary Google business profile. You can create departments under there. You can create a department page for a department profile for the parts department. You can create a parts department profile for service department, right? So you can make all these department pages. And so any business actually has the opportunity to create these. And the cool thing about them is that then you can keyword stuff those. Because <laughs> if you're talking about the specific thing, then uh -huh. it's reasonable to put that, that those keywords like auto repair department of Southside now, Honda. Would that an agency do this in lieu? Why wouldn't the service department have its own Google listing on location as compared to, say, the sales department? It's at the same address. And so it's a good idea to create department pages and connect them together. You could actually probably stand up individual things. But the nice thing about it is that the profiles will show, uh, or the department pages will show on the primary listing. So if you look up Southside Honda. I don't see any auto dealers ever doing that. Have you? Oh, yeah, all the time. Auto you dealers do it all the time. So you, then you'll have a new section that says departments and you'll have links to the individual profiles. So this is a tactic that for some industries is pretty valuable and allows you to, to keep good rankings with the keywords in the titles of those. 
So that's one one quick thing. Yeah. Awesome. Yep. I have one final thing. You can now, if you leave the review through the Google Maps app, upload a video with your review. Yes. So I that's a that. wonderful thing to encourage people to do. It really makes that review stand out. And so getting more videos on your profile is pretty, pretty helpful. You can also upload videos to your profile itself. A great way to make your listing stand out because if you're scrolling results on the Maps app or on mobile, Videos play automatically, so eye-catching, especially mm. if that's like the first picture as you're scrolling and then, you know, sparks flying or you see something that really draws you in. So I love that tip. And I think that uploading videos to your- There's gotta be a good signal to, around that too. That review is definitely gonna get some action for sure. Totally. And you're definitely get more dwell time, more engagement, but it's the eye-catchiness of it. And it's this sort of, most of your competitors are not doing it. So it's an, it's another way to make yourself stand out. It's a great one. Awesome. If you didn't catch it already, Darren's from Canada. That's the about and the that's it. Right? Yeah. I always, I love that about Canadians. Yeah. So yeah, Darren's from Canada. Tell us a little bit about you personally, Darren. You got, you live in Edmonton, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I live in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. It's minus 20 Fahrenheit here today. It's extremely cold. It's like we are in some kind of cold snap right now. Yeah. Yeah. So I've got a daughter. She's 12. I've been married to my high school sweetheart for nice. 25 years now. So how do people get a hold of you? They, if they want to reach out, they want to connect yeah. with White Spark. I've got the ticker going down there below. So you've got whitespark.ca if you want to yep. get a hold That's of White That's our website, whitespark.ca. You can find me everywhere. I'm all over Twitter and LinkedIn. And I even got a YouTube channel where I teach people about local SEO. I'm on TikTok now. I thought uh -oh. I could get in there with all the kids. I'm not dancing. I'm just teaching people about local <laughs> SEO. You can find us on Instagram, White Spark Instagram. So yeah, we're definitely everywhere. Search for Darren Shaw or White Spark Local SEO. You'll find me out anywhere you get your SEO news. Awesome. I got the ticker down there for LinkedIn. Darren, when does the official study like get released? Yeah, so we're working on it now. I got my spreadsheet. I'm crunching the numbers. I'm working with our in-house designer to design the new layout. We're shooting hard to have it mostly done by the end of next week. So we'll probably publish it early the following week. So maybe even by the time this podcast comes up. So it should yeah. be soon in the next week or two. Sweet. And then when you publish it, where are people going to be able to find it? So it'll always be at whitespark.ca. If you just go to whitespark.ca under resources, it's always the top resource. It's, awesome. it's the resource. It's the Bible of local SEO. Amen. Awesome. Darren, thanks a lot for just spending 45 minutes with me and our audience. Appreciate all of the great insights, especially from the new study and all the insights you've got from your round of experts. Really appreciate your time. Appreciate your contributions to the industry and really look forward to having this episode go live and debuting and looking forward to your, your ranking factor study for 2023. Thank you. It was a pleasure. I always love chatting about local SEO and thanks for having me on, man.